over the years. We, as I said, we got a great program. John, why don't you say a few words and then I'll introduce George. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. One of the things that uh, we've been doing here, certainly at Big Data NYC, our event, has been we've been at every Hadoop World. Uh, it's our sixth year, um, mostly on site, and now we have our own event. But our focus is to get the data to you guys as fast as possible out on the network, programming live videos, tweets, research, and, and specifically getting high quality research for free out there and really sharing that data with everyone. And I think our focus is live in the moment, get that in real time out there. And I think, you know, I'm really proud to, to be part of that Wikibon team and lead that effort with Dave because it's just a really needed service. People want to know what, where the signal is. So it's a lot of noise and our goal is to extract the signal from the noise and it's really fun to do. I love, uh, love what we do and we, we're glad to share them. Really appreciate it that you guys have come tonight. So. Uh, thank you very much, and we're going to enjoy the presentation. Some new information being shared, and then uh, party at 7. So thanks for coming. Okay, George Gilbert, um, one of our newest analysts, not our newest analyst, but uh, he, uh, on the chairs here you see his uh, systems of intelligence, his sort of platform foundation, his version of a manifesto. George is going to be sort of giving an update to that today, uh, sharing his, his ideas, uh, getting your thoughts. So without further ado, George, George Gilbert. So just um, as a matter of, uh, by way of context, um, Dave said um, he wanted me to review the presentation with him before I gave it, and uh, he wanted to review it like a week ago. So I showed up and um, I, I had 45 slides and I said, I can't do it in one minute less than three hours. And he said, you have 20 minutes. Um, and I was like, well, that doesn't really work, until he said, your end of year bonus is going to be inversely proportional to the length of your presentation. So this is going to be very short. Um, <laughs> I hear clapping already. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So just by way of context, 50 years we've been building systems of record. Uh, many of you are familiar with the term from Jeffrey Moore. Um, and it's been associated with ERP and CRM apps, but it's really um, gone on much longer. These are the main mainstay apps that we've been building um, really since the 1960s, whether they're mainframes with terminals or client server systems and, uh, with Unix backends or even SaaS apps. They're all about automating uh, business processes. Now, um, it's become kind of fashionable to talk about systems of intelligence or systems of insight, and I'm going to do the same, but I want to add five what I think are different things. First, I want to talk about uh, what customers should be investing in. There's two analytic pipelines that are different um, from what we have in, in legacy systems. Uh, second, there's some trade-offs that every customer has to take into account when they build these systems. Um, and the trade-offs depend on your particular circumstances, and I'll explain what that means. Then, um, as part of considering the, the trade-offs, your customer journey, it's not like there's, there's one customer journey um, for everyone. The path is going to be dependent on some of the choices you make when you start out. Uh, then I want to touch on industry dynamics, uh, industry trends, and, and competitive dynamics. Um, and how they relate to systems of intelligence, uh, and then sort of action items for users, which is what platforms sh should you be considering? So with that as a, a lead-in, uh, I want to start with uh, looking at uh, systems of record. Um, on the left side, this should be somewhat familiar, the ERP systems, the operational data, what's kind of new are the, the new channels of customer interaction but still um, automating business processes. The key things to remember are um, that we did the analytics in systems of record were really about historical performance reporting. Um, I'm showing a, a phone bill, but it could be, you know, a look at historical sales numbers. The key thing is it's backward looking and the limitations of this type of analytics are sort of like 
trying to steer a ship by looking backwards at its wake. So there are two pipelines here, and I want to point them out so that I can highlight what's different about systems of intelligence. The first pipeline on top, uh, production ETL, these are hardwired to the reports and business intelligence visualizations uh, that, um, that the end user organizations ask for. These are high latency, these, are, these take a while to crank. Um, and there's no closed loop because they're, the results come in so far after the fact that they can't reasonably feed back into the operational apps and improve them for the most part. The second pipeline, this is when the end user organizations, they ask for new reports or new visualizations. But the production ETL pipelines are so brittle and hardwired um, to deliver just the data and just the answers that were originally requested that you kind of have to unravel the whole thing and start over. Not entirely, but the point is um, it's very brittle. Uh, and in terms of agility, um, it's pretty poor. Now, just to name a couple companies and their old heritage in this world, um, we had the Teradatas and the Oracles um, uh, dominating uh, data warehouses and Informatica's heritage was in the uh, pipelines. Um, but I want to use these as a, a stepping off point to look at um, what's new about systems of intelligence. Now, here with systems of intelligence, I grade out what's the same. The operational applications don't really go away, but we modernize them by putting two new analytic pipelines on them. The first one is the production pipeline, sort of like the one that generated the reports, only this one is about automated and high-speed predictions or, or recommendations. Um, you might hear products uh, relating to Spark Streaming, Data Torrent, Samza, Flink. Um, the point here is you have very, very uh, low latency, milliseconds to seconds, to make a, a recommendation or distinction. In this case, I'm talking about um, uh, fraud prevention. So do I accept this credit card uh, transaction or do I decline it? You don't have a lot of time. The human is going to move away uh, the, it, you know, if you don't do it within a certain uh, timeline. Same with an, uh, an ad. You have like 700 milliseconds round trip um, to get an ad uh, bid in. Uh, the second pipeline is equally important. This is the pipeline that says, I'm going to get better continuously at making those predictions or recommendations. So this is like that um, last uh, ETL design pipeline where someone wanted new reports. Um, and here it's, again, about agility. But rather than uh, in the last pipeline where you had to um, take days, weeks, months to design um, new reports or visualization. Here, the predictions have to get better continuously, um, whether it's in seconds or in days. And it's together that um, when these are operating uh, efficiently and, and, and fast, that's what equals competitiveness. Now, um, there's no free lunch here. Um, building these systems actually comes with a set of trade-offs. And this is really the heart of the presentation uh, that I want to talk about. There's, um, I, I thought about describing this as a, as a sort of systems budget where you had at the top line the incremental revenue that you get from building uh, a much more intelligent system. In other words, how much fraud you'll save, um, and then all the costs. But in thinking about it, it actually turns out that the knobs, which are the accuracy of the prediction, the speed of the prediction, the agility, and then in the underlying platform, the operational complexity, the development complexity, and your existing infrastructure and skills, all these things are related. So like, if you turn one of these knobs, it'll affect the others. Now, mathematicians 
have a way of describing this, but I was a humanities major, and so that kind of all went over my head. Um, so all I know is if you turn one knob, you know, it'll affect the others. Um, uh, the key thing is, so the top one, um, accuracy of prediction related to incremental revenue. Well, we talked about the speed of predictions and the speed of improving the predictions. Those were the two pipelines that we used to modernize systems of record. And then the choice of the platform um, is related to uh, operational complexity, development complexity, and your existing infrastructure. So now with this guide uh, of trade-offs, um, let's take a look at, at what this customer journey might look like. So now if you add up the knobs and trade-offs from the last slide, um, your journey really depends on, on two big factors. One is the skills that you've accumulated in your enterprise, your skills inventory. Um, and the other is the progress or maturity of the technology platform. That's somewhat out of your control. You can choose which one you want, but your choice is constrained by your skills. So again, they're related. Um, but partly what makes the journey um, up and to the right is that the trade-offs of today get progressively less constraining as your skills improve and as the technology matures. Now, um, I talked about the fraud prevention application in the lower left. It's pretty popular, pretty mainstream today. This is identify spending behavior that's um, out of the norm. I want to point to the intelligent systems management because we've, in our, in our uh, research, we see a lot of people sort of gravitating to that as an application. Um, but we know from many decades, and I'll get into this more uh, later in the presentation, systems management is analogous to um, trying to walk through the La Brea tar pits. Um, it's, it's sticky. Um, but where you would have uh, an intelligent systems management um, working is that it would look at the network and the services that are operating on it and it would figure out what's normal or baseline behavior. And then when there's a failure, the key thing that's so hard about systems management is when something goes wrong, there's like alerts showing up everywhere because something, um, something upstream broke what the downstream components depend on. And in fact, sometimes that ca cascades back up. So the very, the, it's very hard to figure out the root cause. And uh, intelligent systems management, frankly, this is a research project. Um, this is not commercial projects yet, but this is sort of what the vision is as we move up and to the right. Um, it would do auto remediation for you and uh, keep your system sort of in equilibrium. Now, uh, in a few more slides, I'll explain um, why this is so difficult. But before that, I want to dive into sort of the here and now of industry uh, or trends and competitive dynamics. So with that, oh, sorry. Um, now, I, uh, I might not make some, or I might lose some friends with this slide. And, and probably a few more with a couple others coming down, um, coming down the pike. I wanted to divide this into two different categories. Hadoop 2.0, pretty much everyone agrees, once we had Yarn, we had a multi-tenant platform. Um, we could host multiple um, processing engines on one common uh, data set whether on HDFS or HBase. Uh, but the application model, for the most part, was um, dev tool, engine, do your work, drop it in the storage, whether it's HBase or, or HDFS, hand it off to the next tool. It does its work. Kind of a sequential kind of chain. And I know chain is an overloaded term, but it's uh, essentially Essentially, it's a batch process. Um, now, people can point out their storm and 
There are other tools in there that you know, don't have to drop into storage. But the, the fundamental paradigm is um, handing off, um, not as bad as MapReduce, where every step is going to the disk, but uh, it's still fundamentally, um, uh, fundamentally batch. Now, Big Data 3.0, this is not meant to say Hadoop is left out. I'm using this as a framework for what I contend is um, a bunch of themes that are coming together. First, um, we need to dramatically simplify operations and development. It's a bit of a mess right now. I mean, anyone who's participated in this, you know, our recent survey work, um, which we just got back uh, actually last week, 300 practitioners, um, showed that uh, the average number of administrators on a, uh, on a pilot Hadoop cluster, which is about six nodes, uh, required four admins. So the productivity wasn't exactly very high. Now, obviously, people are learning how to operate this, but that number has to improve. So the, the two things, um, well, the three principles we see happening, storage is consolidating. Um, where we don't have 150 storage or database managers. Um, the next one is going to be controversial, but I contend that we're going to see more and more APIs, open APIs, as opposed to purely open source products. Um, and I'll take you through a couple examples. And then the most controversial, and I put it up here just because capturing the nuance won't fit in the headline, but Spark is hollowing out some of the, a good chunk of the processing components of Hadoop. It doesn't mean Hadoop goes away, but it's using sort of Hadoop's management and storage infrastructure and maybe security. Um, but a lot of the processing um, is being substituted for. So uh, let me explain. Uh, I'm going to skip over Hadoop 2.0. Um, talk about storage consolidation in uh, Big Data 3.0, where I say polyglot access, you're seeing more databases show up that support JSON, that su support key value stores. Um, Dave's giving me the signal. I can't tell is if I'm six minutes in or six minutes left. OK. Ha. OK. Yeah, there goes my bonus. <laughs> um, all right. I guess I got a little carried away there. Um, the key thing is, all right, to remember, we've got uh, storage consolidation. Um, the thing that I do want to uh, focus on, the dev tools. This is about Spark. Um, we have, you put streaming up there. Streaming has always been good about uh, machine data, time series, but if you want to do analytics, you know, up until recently, it was about as good as a abacus. SQL was good for joining and filtering and aggregating, but on time series, it was abysmal. And then machine learning was really powerful if you knew how to sort of clean up your data. So what Spark's doing really well is combining all of these. It may not be the best in each one, but the power of reinforcing them all together is uh, quite remarkable. Um, I do want to say one thing, API to storage. Microsoft just announced something called Data Lake, which not the most inspired name, but it's got um, access via SQL, Spark, um, Hadoop, and sorry about this. I'm a little new to PowerPoint 15. Um, anyway, it's got... Uh, multiple APIs, and it definitely represents uh, an example of storage consolidation that's not open source. Now, I want to race through. Um, we talked about the knobs. There's operational um, simplicity. If you look at the left-hand side, this is a network operations center run by a telco. This is AT&T, single pane of glass. That's the ultimate in simplicity. If you look on the right, I've got probably half a dozen consoles. Every, 
every tool helpfully ships with a, with a console. And I say helpfully because, like, I just was running out of battery. If you put all of those together, um, it would probably fit in one square because in terms of operations, you have change management, availability management, performance management, security management, and then one for each level of apps, um, infrastructure, compute. And so all those, if you took all those consoles and you multiplied by six, and that would like fit into one of those squares. That's complicated. Okay, same thing with development. The reason I showed Spark before, um, one of the things that's very uh, compelling about Spark is that integration that they present comes through in a notebook where you can have access to the machine learning, you can have access to the visualization, um, the statistical analysis. If you tried to do that on your own, you'd have a bunch of different tools that would have to go together, uh, that you would have to stitch together. Um, so now, I want to look at the, the more actionable parts of, of what all these trends indicate. I've got a chart with two axes, development simplicity, which we talked about, uh, where I showed um, the spreadsheet versus a bunch of different tools, operational simplicity, where I showed the network operations center, a single pane of glass. If you start at the bottom left, you've got a bunch of data managers. Um, this is where you sort of pick best of breed, because if you're an ad tech company, you have two milliseconds to look up a profile, and I'm dead serious. The, your budget is two milliseconds, so, you know, in that case, you're probably not going to want to rely on Spark. If you go all the way up to the other end, you have the most integration, the most simplicity with Spark. Um, now, um, let me take a look. I want to take a quick look before I get the hook from Dave. Uh, this is at the, at the lower left, where it's, it's pick all the best of breed components. This is an amazing chart done by the 451 group. I can give them credit for segmenting this to the ends of time. Um, I do have to add, I don't think there's a whole lot of actionable information in there. Um, but the con here is complexity. If you decide to choose this, you're an ad, an ad tech company. You are responsible for designing, developing, integrating, testing, delivering, and operating this platform all the components. It's not one component, it's all of them. So you are a software company. Um, I may be dating myself. I don't know how many of you remember when Evil Knievel tried to jump the Snake River Canyon on a motorcycle. Well, don't try this at home. And, you know, not unless you're Netflix or Airbnb or someone like that. Um, the most important part here is where we're looking at the Hadoop ecosystem today, and then what I was calling big data 3.0 tomorrow. And what I didn't um, really highlight when we looked at big data 3.0 is Azure, Amazon, Google Cloud Platform, those guys are building a bunch of native services that are designed to work together. This is where they design it, develop it, develop it integrate it, test it, deliver it, and operate it to work as a unit. So they're the software company, not the enterprise. That's really important. Um, now, uh, the point here is, as you move up and to the right, it democratizes access to this type of, uh, uh, the, the, the platforms democratize access to this type of application. Um, to recap, I just want to look back at the, the knobs and the trade-offs. Systems of intelligence, they create incremental revenue um, or cost savings through automated, accurate predictions. But you can't really create a line item type budget for all of these things. They're all interrelated. As an example, you want to squeeze every last ounce out of prediction, spe uh, prediction speed, like I was talking Talking about ad tech, I'm getting the, and he doesn't have one of those, you know, hooks, so I'm getting the, he's going to break my neck. <laughs> um, uh, so here, you have to build 
a custom platform from the best of breed components. And that means greater operational and development complexity. In other words, again, just a matter of trade-offs. So in the end, as technology matures, um, the spread of the relevant skills also spreads, and that democratizes access to these systems. I've given you uh, a very brief overview. Um, I've probably lost my bonus, but um, I will write this up in excruciating detail, and I'll probably get axed for that too. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to the far more interesting panel that comes next. Oh. So no axes here, but I have to say, so a typical cube crowd, like they want to know when the bar opens, so we open the bar early. So be, be, feel free to wander over, help yourself, get a drink as we continue. But, but before we do that, so we're going to set up for another panel, so we'll have a small break in between. As I say, feel free to go get a drink, uh, and the food will be out shortly. But I was wondering if there are any questions for George. You know, I wanted to cut you off because I wanted some time for audience, audience interaction because that was a major big data injection. And so, um, questions? James. Actually, you know what? Can I get you the... Can I, get you the uh... I was intrigued by that last point. So I, it's, you seem to be implying that the definition of agility is the speed of improving predictions. Is that your definition of it? Or what is agility to you? In the I, model. What is agility? I guess um, think of it as if you if you took your historical data um, and updated your uh, use that to uh, to run through the machine learning um, uh, engine and update your predictive analytics or or your recommendations. If you did that um, weekly or monthly, that's what I would call probably not very agile. If you're in the fraud business, those patterns, or fraud prevention business, those f patterns can change rather quickly. Um, and so agility there might be measured um, where with, ev with every transaction that comes in to accept or decline, you should be adding to your knowledge. That would be very agile. Is it, does that answer your question? It seems to implicitly. I, I just I'd never seen it. For, I think it's a, an intriguing way of defining agility. It's all about next best, next best actions as, de, as calculated by predictive accuracy um, and being able to always hit the next best action at every moment in time across every touch point. So I, 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 like, I like where you're going with this. That was, uh, it was a good way of framing it. I, I agree with the next best actions comment. That is what I'm trying to say. Next best action is, you know, authorize or, or decline. Uh, from IBM, former Forrester analyst. Uh, thank you. Other, other questions, comments? Please. Robert Novak with Cisco, uh, longtime big data veteran, survivor, whatever you want to call it. I was kind of curious about your number of four admins to run a six node Hadoop cluster. Uh, having deployed a number of them with far fewer admins, like one, I'm wondering if that includes other groups within an IT operation, network security, storage, server deployment, politics, whatever you may have, or where that kind of number comes from. Thanks. Yeah, you know, um, it's very, uh, just to repeat the question, it was uh, where did we get that number of four admins for a six node cluster? Um, we're still cleaning up the data. Uh, so, and part of it is time series, like we did a similar survey last year. So we kind of tried to keep the questions, many of the questions the same. Um, but I, I would agree that that sounds hefty, although I have heard you know, maybe not four for every six servers, but it is, it is labor intensive because there are a lot of different types of servers um, that are necessary. George. Great, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself. Yeah, Tyler Radke with City. Um, one of the comments you mentioned was, uh, I think you said Spark was hollowing out some of the processing elements of Hadoop. I just wanted to get your take on uh, the new uh, project from uh, Cloudera, uh, Kudu, which kind of attempts to bridge the gap between like HBase and uh, HDFS. Yeah. Um, actually, Tom Riley was in here just doing a, an interview 
Um, that was the last one before we got ready for the panel. Um, you know, I have to take a closer look at it. it. It has to do, the core of it has to do with that pipeline that reduces the latency between the operational system and the analytic system. That's, that's ultimately what it's trying to solve. Exactly how it goes about doing it, I'm not sure I'm ready to tell you yet because it looked to me like it was a MPP columnar database that was sitting under an MPP columnar database called Impala, so I don't fully understand it. Anybody else want to comment on that? Anybody have thoughts? No? Are you going to fill in the gaps? No? Okay. Good. Question or a comment? Please, please do. Uh, George, George Chow from Simba Technologies. Um, my reading of, of Kudu is that it seems to be the, the, the missing third, because if you, if you think about Impala, uh, that's the query execution, but they, they, they built Impala initially to try to help it, but Impala is not enough, because they really want the storage layer to do more, and Parquet as a format is actually geared toward read-only access. So Kudu is actually, um, you can say, a, uh, a read-write uh, optimize, a, a, a balanced implementation. Oh, of a, of so a in other system. words, it's a substitute. Would would you call it a substitute for both? In other words, it's got the um, it's got the point query capability of HBase with the the scan query capable capability of Impala. Yeah. Ooh. Th that, that's that's why they say it's like it's a balance. They say you know okay. if if you if you measure it against raw HDFS. It will it will lose because it's not geared toward optimal scanning. Right. But and if you do the same against HBase, you know it's not optimized for write either. But it is a balance in the middle. So that's why they 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 they, they position it as operational and analytic because it allows you to do both. Okay. So that if you are, if you have a mixed workload, that's why they position it as a better choice. So okay. if, you, if you take a look at the timeline, when I look at it, they, they claim it's like three years of history, right? Which actually is exactly the same timeline as Impala. Because if you remember, Impala was announced October 2012. Yeah, but this, the development started when they announced Impala. Yeah. Would this suggest that they would de-emphasize Impala? No, actually, this is complementary. This okay. is complementary. I mean, Impala is the query execution. Kudo is just the storage side, okay. which, which uh, enables Impala to do better. Okay. Right. Thank you, George. Appreciate it. All right. Other questions, comments? Okay, we're going to wrap. Okay. Great, George, thank you very much. And uh, no, you don't get your bonus cut. You don't get fired. Thank you. Great job. Right. Really appreciate it, George. <laughs> All right. We're going to do a two minute stage swap, right? You guys want to take a quick break, grab a drink? All right, and then we're coming back. So please come back.